Hello everybody, my name is Jim and I am the author and blog owner of Spongeo Tea. Uh, and for this sponge chat we have a very special guest, John Hughes. Uh, I'm sure you've all worked with his material or read some of his material before. He's a teacher trainer, a materials uh, writer and perhaps a content developer. Uh, in this sponge chat we got to speak about many different things really. We spoke about teacher training uh, and materials writing. We also spoke about teacher training with materials writers interesting how I've spoken about that in any other sponge chats before. Um, John was very kind and shared with many many insights into his uh, into sort of how he got in to his training which he was uh, writing, some advice uh, that he has for for people looking to move into teacher training which he was writing. He also had some book recommendations and we also looked at some of the the, the interesting aspects regarding how uh, course books are made um, and some of the thought processes behind them. Uh, as usual, if you do like this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe um, and of course comment. I would love to hear your comments. I do reply uh, when I can, so feel free to comment either here or on the blog and I'll get back to you. Okay, I hope you enjoy and until next time, take care. Bye! Good morning, John. How are you doing? Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much I'm for well. being. Yeah, thank you very much for being here uh, this morning. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm sure you've obviously seen the sponge chats before, but just for those that perhaps are watching the first time, the first of these these chats, it's really to uh, give teachers an understanding of some of the other career paths that they can take, um, and and look for some advice from professionals such as yourself that have have taken those career moves um, and it all kind of started a few years ago when I received an email from a teacher said how did you move into teacher training and I realized that everyone as I'm sure that that you're going to tell us shortly everyone's the way that they do it is quite different um, and uh, it, it, I, I've been finding it really interesting to, to, to see how different it actually can be um, so I suppose if we can focus on to you, maybe we can start with the question, quite a big question. So who is John Hughes? This is a, this is the question we'll start with. <laughs> uh, who is John Hughes professionally? Um, most people uh, call me uh, a course book author because that's how they know my work. Um, I've been writing my first course book came out in uh, 2006 I think wow. um, and so my name's associated with course books but then uh, some people know me as a teacher trainer if I go to conferences it's always nice when I bump into somebody and says hey remember me I was on your training course in 1998 wow. <laughs> and I try to remember people as much as I can so it depends who, how people have met me. And obviously, I've been a, a teacher for a very long time. I started teaching in uh, 1992. And uh, I still try to teach as and when I can, because um, I think particularly if you write course book materials, or you train teachers, you just need that little reminder of how things really are. I mean, you can read all the theory books in the world, you can write some of the theory books and methodology books, but you'd need to go back and just remind yourself of the reality of, of teaching. It's, it's far more complicated than somehow, sometimes it's presented as being, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, I do that as and when I can, but most of the teaching I do now is kind of volunteer teaching with, okay. uh, I live near Oxford, so it's, it's sort of working maybe with refugee students because I'm kind of unemployable in that I could never commit to a language school to teach a whole term. I just, I, I don't have the time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I do many different things, um, but I would say that's, that's also because I'm self-employed and the nature of freelance life in ELT means that you need to be many different things. You can't just say, I'm just a writer because uh, it's, partly it's, it's uh, in order to uh, make a living, you need to be able to offer different strands, particularly nowadays. And also I would just get bored, to be honest. Um, I just like massive variety. I mean, at the moment, 
things are kind of chaotic. I'm doing different projects, but right. but secretly I really like it when it's like that and it's a bit mad because I'm <laughs> I, I just like different sort of things to my my working life. So yeah. um so when somebody says what do you do, it's it's kind of hard to define. It's sort of it's a bit like, well, what month is it? What am I doing this month? You know, so yeah. Yeah, fair. It's interesting that you mentioned um the idea of freelancing um and making it different i was speaking to nick feature and he was saying that's one aspect that a lot of yeah you know, after you've been teaching for a while and you decide to sort of move into teacher training or materials development it's one aspect a lot of people don't think about uh, that if you do move into freelancing there's that financial aspect to take into account and making sure that you have uh yeah, there's a bit of a culture I've noticed in ELT where it's sort of we talk about teaching and, and talking about money and things seems to be a dirty word, but we are all trying to make a living, you know, so I think if you go into freelance, you need to be prepared to operate like a business. Um, right. You are, you have to have, freelancing isn't for everybody. I know plenty of people who've tried it, hated it and went back and worked for a school and that's absolutely fine. And I have some weeks where I think, God, it'd be nice to have a paid holiday, you know, by <laughs> Um, but um, uh, but there's also I think with freelancing you need if you've got a little bit of that entrepreneurial side to you and uh, and you you do need to operate a bit like a business and okay. people need to be prepared for that if they're going to go freelance you know um, so th I mean that's an aspect of it yeah 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 definitely um, so you mentioned that you started teaching in in 1992 I'm not going to tell you when I was born because it was near there. Uh, so you've been teaching for a while. Um, but then you moved into training and, and materials development. Uh, what, what was the motivation to do that? Was it simply that, as you mentioned, that you you like new things or was it something that you uh, Well, materials writing, um, uh, I always like writing um, even before I went into teaching and as soon as I went into teaching it was a sort of natural thing for me to want to do right um, in fact the first course course the first people I taught they were they were uh, it was during the Bosnian conflict and there were refugees living in London and I wanted to get work experience teaching and so I just did volunteer teaching, but there was no course book. I, th I think somebody gave me a headway. Um, this was first edition headway. So that tells you how old I am because headway is now on its like fifth or sixth edition or something. Yeah. Um, and most teachers have taught with it at some point, but it, it, it quickly came apparent. It wasn't relevant to the students I were teaching who'd arrived in London, needed to survive in London, uh needed english and so actually there was a magazine at the time called time out um mm. which had lots of information about london and that kind of became my course book um and i quickly discovered i enjoyed cutting it up and writing exercise questions and probably writing very bad materials but <laughs> i was teaching the lesson so those materials worked for me um and students responded to that more so it taught me a lot about using authentic materials right. um, and I like the immediacy of saying to the students so what do you need to do with English okay let's do that and um that kind of made sense to me um so materials writing happened quite quickly and I think material people who like writing materials for their own lessons if they want to move into published materials then very quickly they learn that they like sharing their materials with other teachers. I mean, the best test of a piece of material is to write it, use it in your lesson, but then hand it to another teacher and say, can you say teach this lesson? And that's the ultimate test of whether you can really write materials, because if another teacher can use it and they like it uh, and, and it works for them, then that's you're on, on your way. Um, in terms of teacher training, I think for me, it was tied up with that in that I was one of those teachers who liked to experiment and then was happy to stand up in a teacher's room during a teacher's meeting and say, hey, have you tried this? Here's an idea you could do. Yeah. And that's for many teacher trainers, that's the first step into teacher training, even even maybe in your first or second year of only teaching when actually, you know, you really don't know that much. You haven't kind of, you, you're just starting out, but you've tried something that you're quite proud of and you want to share it with other people. 
And that's actually lots of teacher trainers. That's really their sort of first. That's the first sign that you maybe you're a teacher who would also in the future like to go down the training route, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, similar for me, I suppose. Um, it's just sharing those ideas. Interesting, you mentioned um, a lot of you know uh, people that are developing their materials that are sharing them now, um, and. I, I think that's the, um, one of the most amazing things of, of the having access to the internet now with, with so many blogs and things that are available. Uh, it seems like there's, there are, it's becoming quite common now for people just to share loads of their materials online, um, which is amazing for teachers because free materials that, I mean, some are great, some are not so great, but you know, it's, it's having access to all of this stuff that teachers are creating is, is, is really good. I suppose that if for those looking to move into maybe working with publishers, it helps to have them have a sort of a portfolio online. Would you agree? Uh, yes, to some extent. Uh, I think it's harder nowadays because there's so much online. Um, it, it's almost overwhelming. Right. So if you wanted to get published, it, it's, almost, it's, it's hard in a sense to get spotted because your so one much. voice amongst the multitude um and also if you're a teacher looking for materials um there's a lot of material out there but if you want to find materials that genuinely will work or have been tried and tested you kind of have to go back to you probably end up going back to have it, having a brand name is almost becomes important where people think, oh, you're a person online who always produces really good worksheets. I'm going to go find your, you know, your post on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is. So it's it's it, it, in that sense because I was I was I was in ELT before the days of the internet. So getting your <laughs> materials seen involves sending it off, typing it out, sending it off to. I exaggerate. I mean, we did email it off to people, but but it, it, and it got pushed put, published in sort of paper based journals and things right. like that, and that's how you got noticed. But there just wasn't the quantity of stuff that there is now. Um, so you could get noticed a bit more that way. Um, and I would still tell writers or would be writers to get published in journals because journals have editors and editors decide, you know, take a look at something and think, well, is it, is it, is it, you know, is it usable or right. they'll give you feedback. Whereas with online stuff, you just write it, you post it and it may or may not work. So I think actually putting it through an editor or, you know, people who check the stuff is, is means that from a teacher's point of view, you're more likely to find something in a teaching journal that's possibly going to work quite well okay. rather than just sort of randomly searching around. Um, so, uh, but I think if you want to get, yeah. And if you want to get with a publisher, then publishers probably still look in journals for things because it's it's had that edited aspect to it's gone through that process right yeah yeah so um with the move into into teacher training or materials development were there any sort of bumps along the way any sort of troubles that you came up against and if there were how did you how did you overcome them um Teacher training was just a question of, uh, like I say, the first language schools I worked for, um, uh, it helped that they were language schools that encouraged teacher development. I mean, there's plenty of teachers working in the schools, working for language schools that don't, they're not really interested in the teachers having teachers meeting or teachers workshops. Um, you know, I've met teachers along the way who said, I didn't even know conferences existed until this year. And they'd been working in ELT for 10 years because they just hadn't worked in the types of language school that encourage professional development, particularly. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it, it, for anybody who wants to get into teach training, making sure you work for a school that gives space for professional development is obviously important. Um and then putting yourself forward to maybe, it doesn't have to be a whole workshop. It can be, I remember one of the first schools I worked at, we had 30 minutes in our teachers meeting where anybody could share a five minute idea, which just encouraged everybody to come along and say, well, I've tried this and I've tried this. And 
that that helped build my confidence as a would-be trainer. Um, I think, um, and then in terms of training, I well, I got involved in the Trinity certificate TESOL. So I started being a trainer on that, working on that part time uh, when I lived in Italy. Uh, and that was a good opportunity for me to, to, to really get into teacher training properly by getting attached to a formally a formal kind of uh, teaching qualification, like, you know, the sort of thing that Tr Trinity would offer or Cambridge would offer. Um, if you can get attached to that kind of course, it's also good from, for you from a teacher training point of view, because with teacher training and conferences, like you can put yourself forward to present at a conference, but you're kind of presenting your view of something. Whereas if you train on a certificate course or a diploma, you're presented with, well, this week you have to do a session on uh, classroom management. And it, it really, that really trains you as a trainer to think, okay, now I've got to design something and I've got to look around, read around, find out what other people have said about this topic and, and create a session that's genuinely uh, valuable. And that's the point at which as a trainer, you also start sort of researching and reading around. And um, uh, so I think that's actually, that's if you, if you can get involved in a course like that, it's probably one of the, the best things you can do in terms of developing your training skills. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm. Uh, I, I'm. I haven't actually had the opportunity yet to to, to get involved in a certain solo or so. Um, the the main the majority of the training that we do is sort of in service. Um, and I, I was speaking to to Kandu Koti uh, a little while ago, I think, in my last punch chat, and she made the distinction. You know, there's the distinction between like training on a training course, like a certain TESOL, for example, and maybe looking at the development aspects within institutions. Um, and it seems like they're quite different, um, you know. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, I mean, that's a good point, actually. I mean, the other aspect of training is if you're a DOS in a language school and you're analyzing people's uh, development needs, um, uh, it, 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 it widens your definition of what training is as well, because training development, it doesn't necessarily have to be an input session. It can be less an observation. It can have nothing to do with you actually running training. It can be you just facilitating some kind of like it might be. Uh, a teacher who's having an issue and you come across an article in a magazine and putting it in front of the teacher and saying, have you read that? Because that addresses what you're doing. So you, you're the definition of what you are as a trainer. And this is particularly true of directors of studies and their role in certain sorts of language schools. I imagine it's similar in your context. Um, you know, staff have different individual needs mm. Um I was too, I was interviewing uh, as a, a different project connected. I've been working on an online project into ELT management and I interviewed a variety of managers and I interviewed a, a manager of a language school in southern Spain recently and he said when it comes to development of course you know you've got the, the, the new teacher who's freshly qualified off a certificate they need a certain sort of training yeah. um, but then you've got another teacher who's experienced and they're doing their diploma and they just want to be left alone because they've already got enough training going on in their lives and you, you know as a director of studies or teacher training you're managing all those different needs and requirements of, of different teachers and then you've got some you know you may have some staff who don't particularly want to attend teacher training sessions or something but that doesn't maybe maybe it's not it's not that they're not interested in developing but they just want to develop in a different kind of way i mean yeah. maybe they spend their days looking around social media and clicking on things but they're watching a video about something that's engaging them so there's you know as a trainer working in service training you kind of have to think in different ways about it possibly I think that's uh, perhaps one of the most difficult things. Um, again, before the, the academy where I work now, I worked in quite a large academy. We had uh, like 36 teaching staff and trying to meet the needs of all of them was 
very, very difficult, especially when we had limited resources and there was more or less the assistant director of studies, the director of studies myself that were mm. running the, the training. So that, that was quite difficult. Now I'm working in a much smaller academy, um, uh, which I find much easier to manage in terms of getting everyone's needs met. Um, it's also because we have uh, the teaching staff is not as varied in terms of teaching experience. They're, they're more or less the same uh the same level or years of experience uh and so, so that's certainly a lot easier um it's definitely one of the things that i didn't think about before moving into teach training and, and into management is looking at that um certainly the the inspire model for, for teacher training um from Ioli and, and and i think it's richardson um mm-hmm. has, has helped us a lot in terms of trying to give us a focus on 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 running the development programs um but that's definitely something i, I think that if, if, if people are looking to move into training and management to take into consideration, because it is difficult, at, at least for me, uh, making sure that you're able to, to make that, that development personalized and relevant to all teachers and, and, and staff, whilst also meeting the needs of the institution. I think that's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I do think there's a lot, if you've taught for a while, there is a lot you transfer from teaching into training. Um, you know the way you plan a lesson uh, is often the structure of it can be often reflect the way you might uh, plan a teacher training session, or um, and also that the the idea of knowing go what's if you're a teacher an important part is knowing what's going on in your students' lives, uh, you know, sort of you know outside the class as well, and in the same way with um, when you're training teachers. Um, there are moments in people's lives when they've got stuff going on at home and the last thing they need is the director of studies saying, how are you developing in this area? And you think, well, no, actually, I'm dealing with a crisis at home. It's, 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 um, it's, there's all those kinds of interpersonal skills you need connected with it. And, and, and picking your moments, I think, you know, is this the right moment for somebody to be actually trying to think about some this when something else is going on, you know? Um, that's been particularly true in the last 18 months with the pandemic yeah. and the kind of the overwhelming torrent of information about online teaching. Um, it's, uh, it, it's just been, it, it's been kind of a, a crazy quantity of information that people are being asked to, to deal with. Um, and in a sense, I think we've we've needed to sort of limited our options. You can't learn everything about online teaching immediately. Um, mm. I mean, online teaching has been going on for the. I think I delivered my first online course in two thousand and four in a very wow. basic kind of way. Um, but uh, but what's happened in the last eighteen months? I mean, I, there was one survey. I I've been involved working with some publishers on surveys. It was about. Seventy-five percent of the teachers had never taught online until wow. March 2020. So you, you're talking about this vast quantity of teachers. It's like suddenly they're being asked to do something that they were not trained to do. Yeah. So that's been, you know, so any other strategic planning you might have had about how you're going to develop teachers in different areas, that's all just gone out the window, you know. Yeah. And that's um, and then how that training has been done for online teaching i mean the trainers have been learning how do you do a zoom lesson at the same time they're trying to train the teachers to do it so it's um uh, it's it's not been a kind of a typically representative time in that sense uh and we've all had to develop skills quite quickly yeah yeah no it's been it's been very interesting thankfully here um i'm not sure how it is in the uk at the moment but we're 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 back to i say normal inverted commas um so all of our all of our sort of classes are back in person and we only have like one or two classes online uh the teachers appreciate that (laughs) and so do the learners um but the the the, like the big year if you will like 12 months ago that was that was that was a big shock to the system um especially delivering delivering training online well we, we managed it quite well but again we have quite a small team um i think what was interesting we were all reminded that uh that learning is more than just attending lessons and we all kind of miss that incidental stuff that happens outside in the corridor or between the breaks and it's it was the sort of networking chatting side that we missed 
I think that's especially true for, true for teacher training. I mean, you can run a training session, but actually a lot of the learning and development probably happens when teachers go off and have coffee together afterwards and talk about what came up um, and, and, and the reflection time. Um, and uh, I think with the, the online format, particularly this kind of live Zoom format, it, it, um, it highlighted the need for that some kind of space that allowed that kind of incidental learning as well. And I'm sure that's, you know, what lots of students missed about their English class, not just the lessons, but the, the social chit chat side before Definitely. and after. I mean, even now, especially with online conferences, I mean, they, they, they've got a lot better over the last 12 months. They have a lot of platforms which are quite chic and lots of things that you can do, but you still, it's nothing like going to a real conference. You know what I mean? Like, um, but when, you, when you suddenly realize the importance of networking, you don't necessarily, I don't mean networking in, in the sense of constantly trying to make business contacts. It sounds very like business English, doesn't it? <laughs> networking. But it's more kind of what I mean is that just that accidental social stuff. You know, you don't have those accidental meetings with people that you get at a face to face conference. And I just, uh, I just, it, I don't know that you can simulate it in the same way uh, online. I mean, you do have accidental meetings in social media, I, I guess, in that sense, but it's, it's still not quite the same. It's not the same. At least for me, it's not the same. Um, anyway, hopefully things get better. We'll see. We'll see what happens with Omnicrom at the moment. Um, yeah. Now, speaking about training, uh, you, you uh, are running courses, I believe, with Oxford uh, for training materials writers, and you've been doing this for, for, for quite a long time. Um, what is, so, so looking at training in general, but we're going to get to more specific now uh, with training materials writers. Um, what models of this actually work and uh, what's your experience with this and, how, and how, how do you find this different to other sort of aspects of training? Um, the, w with training materials writing, it's, um, it depends on the nature of the course. A lot of the courses I run with the university are tend to be short courses. So I may only have uh, overall 10 hours contact time. And then if it's an online course between the synchronous lectures online, if you like, or meetings, um, there will be online stuff for people to do. But in a, in a, in a short course like that, um, it's very much uh, the kind of craft model approach. Yeah. If you know the work of Wallace, he talks about the reflective approach, but he, with the craft model, it's regards sort of training as um, it's, it's very focused on the technical and getting certain basic principles right and saying, here's a sort of model version of it. What does it require to reproduce that? Can you reproduce it in your lessons? And that's typically the model you get on initial teacher training courses, um, you know, because people can't reflect if they haven't done it before kind of thing. Um, so with materials writing, if it's that kind of materials writing, then I might present, here's one way to do it, have a go at doing it yourself, and now let's have another go. And if I've got teachers for longer, I can let them slowly give them more freedom to experiment. And obviously on some courses you get, you get very experienced material writers turn up, teachers who've been doing it a long time and they've, they may have even published materials. I get some people on the course who are working for publishers. Um, and with that, it's a much more reflective approach you're taking. You're saying, look, here's one way of, of writing material. How does, what, what's your feeling about it? How's it worked for you? How have you changed it? And so on. So it, it, like all training courses, it depends a little bit on who I've got with me. Um, and, and also... Also, what kind of material... I mean... Ma 20 years ago, when we talked about materials, we basically meant worksheets and course books. Now, right. when we talk about materials, we're talking about video, media, wow. uh, digital stuff. Um, and it's quite interesting because, I mean, I've, I've been 
learning new digital platforms for materials writing because increasingly I'm having to write digital content. Um, so there's much more just, just technical skills you need to have to deal with the software. Uh, and so suddenly we've gone, we've taken a step back from, ooh, let's create lots of creative materials back to let's create something that's, that you know has to fit into technical requirements okay. and you know to be honest there's a lot of gap fill exercises now being written again it's almost like we're going back the other way uh because this is what you know if you're using an app or something digital it's it's variations of a theme of of gaps so i'm not being critical about it but it but it just as a materials writer it, it's different right and I think lots of people who, be, who go into materials writing, they're quite creative people. So actually working in this way is quite challenging because you're thinking, OK, I've got a platform that will basically produce 10 different exercise types. How do I build creativity into that I alongside the limitations of the platform? Yeah. Wow. Um, and I kind of like that because I'm like, I like people... Um, I quite like to be given limitations and constraints about on a project work within those and then work out how I can just add my own little kind of flair to it to, right. to make it work. And so working with digital content is quite challenging in that way. So there's, there's learning that. And if you're running a training course, um, it's, it's difficult to know what you're going to choose. Am I going to teach the, the trainees to write worksheets? Am I going to train them to, uh produce digital content and if so are they delivering this content on a phone or on a tablet on a laptop because the screen size affects everything um how are your students going to be using this content uh that affects the writing am i helping teachers to produce video content because it's very easy to produce your own video content now i mean uh, you know, you don't have to go and find a, a YouTube video and then write a worksheet for it. It's, sometimes it's easier just to go and make your own video with your phone, you know. Um, so there's there's lots to so many different strands to it. I mean, there's this phrase that lots of materials write content creator. And um, and it's sort of there's a resistance to calling ourselves content creator. But in many ways, it, it, it's it's more representative of what we do now. I mean, I used to be a materials writer. If I was asked to write a course book, I knew it was a mm. book. Um, and there were little add-ons, like maybe there was a bit of video added on for a little bit of excitement and it helped the marketing people sell the book. And there was a CD-ROM in the back with some digital stuff that nobody ever used. Mm. But now um, you don't approach a published course series as a book necessarily it's it's the whole package so in a sense you're not just materials writing you are content creating and you know i get involved where i can in the video creation side of things and uh, so there's got to be lots of different strands to what you're doing um interesting so possibly content creator is a better term but that's that's so broad that then if you're going to deliver training into that area what aspects are you dealing with yeah um, i mean that, i think that there are lots of technical skills you can cover i think lots of people think that you know materials writing is just creative it is but there's a whole chunk of it that's just technical just knowing how to write a decent instruction mm -hmm. or knowing how to scaffold a basic worksheet for another teacher to use not how you, not the necessarily and writing material that you wouldn't necessarily teach it that way but it's going to be used in a certain context by certain teachers who need it a certain kind of way and those those are just sort of technical skills that sometimes are are overlooked but then it depends on do your do the trainees, the participants on your course, are they learning materials writing just to improve their own materials writing ideas? Or are they doing it with a view to possibly self-publishing or even publishing it with a publisher? And that, that affects your approach as well. So I have a, a, a sort of question that links onto that. Um, so when, when training occurs for materials developers, is sort of research into to language acquisition taken into account? Uh, so, for example, I don't know, order of acquisition or uh, the need for output and input, all that sort of stuff. Is that sort of something that's pushed onto materials developers or is it something that they just bring in on their own or is that sort of determined by publishers themselves? Uh, it varies a lot. It depends how 
driven it is by the author. If the concept is the author's, then it's very much the author's view of how you teach a, a, a lesson. So if you look at some of the, uh, the books from the past, like Headway, English File, Cutting Edge, they were very influenced by the author teams. They may, right. might, maybe there were a couple of authors who ended up producing the whole series. Okay. Um, and their philosophy on how lessons are taught and so on, that infused the book throughout. Okay. Now, because the nature of materials publishing has changed so much and we're all working in teams and groups, <clears throat> um, it's defined much more at the outset what the approach of the book's going to be, and that may often come from the publisher. But bear in mind that the publisher's probably been around the world, interviewed lots of teachers, trainers, uh, DOSs, got their feedback, and they've kind of amassed this sort of general perception of what the material should be. Right. Equally, you can read the work of people like Brian Tomlinson, who... Um, would be uh, perhaps critical of a lot of those books out there because they don't necessarily reflect what the theory shows in universities in terms of uh, language acquisition and so on. Um, and and that's that's where you get you get that sort of conflict about are the materials principled? Are they reflecting what we actually know about language learning? But there are so many factors involved, like the cultural context of where the material is being used, um, what your expectations are in terms of teacher training. Um, okay. I mean, it's all very well saying have a task based approach in your course book, but that isn't much good if the teachers in the place where the book's being used have, are not receiving teacher training in how to deliver task based learning. I mean, it, you know, there's only so much the material can do. It still relies on teachers being trained to use it yeah. in a certain kind of way. Yeah. So there's so much complexity to it all. Um, but yes, I mean, you would expect the materials that you write to reflect sort of good practice and the experiences you've had as a teacher. But also, I mean, this is where I always think a background in teacher training really helps a materials writer. I mean, if anybody wants to get into materials writing, they should also try to train teachers as well, because, I mean, I've been lucky to just observe so many teachers through lesson observations and giving feedback that I've seen, you know, teachers from all sorts of countries, backgrounds, experiences teach. And when you write materials that are going to be published, you're thinking, yeah, I'm trying to write for all of those people. <laughs> so... So what do you do? Or, it, or it's, or it's got to be material that will work for every type of teacher. The teacher who's just got qualified and needs all the support you, your material can give them. Yeah. Through, the, through the teacher who's maybe been teaching 20 years, writes a lot of their own stuff, um, but basically uses your course book as a springboard. I mean, I've observed teachers use my materials and I haven't recognized my own materials because they've been used by teachers who just use the book as a springboard, but they photocopy it, cut it up, stick bits of paper on the wall, which might be bits of text from the book, and um, uh, which is kind of fun to watch. You know, I don't mind as long as the materials <laughs> inspired them and helped them and saved them a bit of time, you know, and yeah. it's, it's just given them an idea for that day kind of thing. Equally, you might observe the lesson where the teacher just does every exercise on the page, and the students love the lesson and the teacher gets great feedback. And that's also very rewarding, you know. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, the whole thing of um, where theory meets practice. But that's that's not just in materials writing. That's in every aspect. In every the aspect. LP. There is a huge divide between what's being talked about academically and what's happening in classrooms and the two seem to sort of struggle to meet in the middle for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. It also goes back to this issue of uh, people writing methodology books and so on. You think, well, when was the last time you went and taught a lesson? Because the, the theory is great, but actually you get into a classroom with 20 students, all with different personalities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the real world could be, you know, the theory Last maybe just doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, it's complex and it's, we don't have enough time to 
to deal with it here. But yeah, exactly. I suppose that also comes down to one important aspect of training, at least for me, in sort of in in, in sort of local training context, is is uh, working with teachers and how they view the course book and how they're able to uh, as I think the course books are, are very good, especially for you know novice teachers. It provides them a good level of support. But as you as you mentioned, as teachers get more experience, they start to use it as a springboard, and and seeing that and, and helping teachers realize that they can do that and they can exploit it to to the you know to meet their learners' needs and wants. Um, yeah, I mean, when I do I do lots of talks to support course books I've written to groups of teachers at conferences, and there's always a ripple of shock goes around the room when I say I'm the author, but I don't expect you to teach everything in my book. Or the teachers will say we we can't we can't fit the whole book into the academic year, and I say, well, leave some of it out then. I mean, there's all <laughs> real surprise. What? But this is the author. You must expect me to do every <laughs> single. Um, and uh, of course I don't, but what I am, I mean, I did, a, I did a sort of survey with teachers some years back on what they thought the role of the course book was. And I generally found about three categories. Um, so that in the responses, there was sort of the teacher who expected the course book to provide them with everything. And when they opened the lesson page, they started exercise one, they finished at exercise 10 and they did it all in that, in the order I'd written. And then there's the other teacher who does exercise one, two, and three, jumps to exercise six, seven, does exercise 10, but then brings in something else that they've made. And that's the sort of springboard teacher. And then there's other teachers who just say, well, I don't really use the course book much, but I might flick it open. I like the reading text or the video, and then I do something else with it. And you're really writing materials for that three different types of teachers. But ultimately, as a materials writer, your first responsibility is to the teacher who wants to start at exercise one and finish at exercise 10. Right, right. Because that could be the new teacher who is trying to survive. Let's face it, your first yeah. couple of years of teaching are about survival. You go from doing a four week CELTA course into doing you know, 20, 30 contact hours a week. I mean, it's insane. You're just not ready for it. And so you need to survive. And the one thing that needs to be constant is not what is the latest acquisition theory. It's can I open the course book and can I deliver this class? Because I've got very little preparation time and I'm just starting to learn. Yeah. And possibly that's where they need the teacher's book to support it. Um, and then teachers can sort of start experimenting and they can start doing unplugged lessons, but let them learn how to do basic lessons before they move into all of that, you know. So. Definitely. Yeah, that, that's a good point that you raise. Um, thinking back to my first two or three years of teaching the course book was very much. I don't think I think I was more like number two. The first year was number one and then the second year, number two. And as it's progressed, I've, I've done different things. But, Actually, uh, it's interesting because my, my, my thing was my first year of teaching, I was far more arrogant. I was probably teaching number three and thought, oh, I just used the course book <laughs> and then do my own stuff. And then realizing actually one that I didn't do enough um, and I needed to be a bit more, have a bit more humility about what I was doing, but also just learning to teach properly with the course book is an incredibly effective use of, we go back to professional development, if, you know, just training yourself to work with other people's materials in different ways mm. and doing everything in the course book and still doing a good lesson. That, and that in itself is, is actually quite a, a useful skill. And for future materials writers to have worked with other people's materials and used it effectively in class, you learn a heck of a lot about what makes, you know, good materials. Yeah. Um, and, and actually in the survey I did, there were some teachers who responded who did do every exercise in the book. They were quite experienced teachers. They simply weren't interested in writing their own materials. I mean, that's not, you know, why, why should they be that they wanted the course book to provide them with everything. They still got great feedback from their students. You know, they did very effective lessons. They just didn't, they weren't interested in the writing side of things themselves. I mean, for the majority of teachers, time is just not. Yeah, available. totally, time. And it's not, and in materials writing is just, it's a very different strand within ELT. It's not, um, I mean, the, I, I always think the craziness of materials writing is you go into teaching partly for the sort of social side and mm. meeting students and all the rest of it. And you go from that 
seeing tons of people every day to being a materials writer and spending six, eight months writing a book sitting on your own. I mean, it's, it's crazy, really. It's, it's not, it's a totally different skill set in that sense. So, yeah, that's a, I suppose one thing that comes to mind then is developing when you become a materials writer is very much through the process of it really, no? Uh, and through that editing process of getting feedback and, and perhaps doing short courses like your own. Um, yeah, I mean, learning sort of self-discipline as well, starting, I always start at eight, I finish at four. Um, you know, I don't, I, I meet some writers who sort of, they, they work crazy hours through the night, but I'm actually, I soon learned to just treat it like a normal working day, like anything else. And I okay. find even if I wake up at eight, you know, I start work at eight and I'm not in the mood for writing that day, then I just make myself get on and do it because it, sure. I don't think you can write. I, I have to write like that. Um, so self-discipline, yeah, organising like that. But I need, I do need to inject things in between writing. So if I have a big project, I mean, I've just come, uh, I had a two-year period where I was working on, series of books so it really was a big chunk of writing but I had to take breaks from it and go off and do a little bit of teaching and do training just to sort of keep things going um, and also with writing it's nice if you can teach a lesson because you just test something out sometimes I mean sometimes you've got a slightly yeah. wacky idea and you think yeah, I wonder if that actually worked in the classroom it's been a while I need to test that one out and you do it with a bunch of students and they look at you like you're mad and you think, yeah, that's not going in the course book. Um, <laughs> or, or it's an activity that you can kind of make it work. I mean, I always say this on my training courses, you can write material that will work in your lessons because you teach in a certain kind of way and your students are used to the way you do things. But for plenty of other teachers, they would look at that and think, well, I, yeah, that's not going to work in my class. I mean, I um, so, yeah, materials writing when it's being used by other people is, is quite a different thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so we're coming to the end sort of now, but I have two more sort of sections, if you will. Um, yeah, I'll be less wordy, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the second last one is the advice. Now, you've already given us loads of advice, but if you had to choose perhaps your, your one major piece of advice for teacher trainers or your one major piece piece of advice for potential materials writers what would they be oh just get as much different experience and as wide as possible and go out of your comfort zone so when I started teaching I ended up by accident involved in business English teaching but I absolutely grew to love it which led into communication skills training right um uh, so when accidents and opportunities turn up, just have a go at doing it, you know, or teaching a young learners group if you don't do that that often. And, and if you can get that wide amount of experience, it really prepares you to be more effective as a trainer and a writer because you're able to draw on that sort of wide experience, you know. And also, I mean, to be honest, from a practical point of view, if you're going to stay in work in the future and you do decide to go freelance, the more different strands to what you do, yeah. the better. So if you've got a wide range of experience of teaching exam classes, adults, teenagers, younger learners, it qualifies you to train in lots of different areas. Uh, and the same way with writing. I mean, people would love to say, oh, I specialize in writing English for academic purposes, course books. Well, that will find that will keep you going for a year or so, but it won't keep you in work. You need to be able to jump across and write that course book for young teenagers, uh, you know, a week later type of thing. So just get experience and also observe other teachers um, because teacher training and materials writing is all about, it's, it's not about how you do it. It's about how lots of different people do it. Right. Um, I'm always concerns me when I see people online coming out saying, this is the way to teach and thinking, yeah, it might be in your class, but what about all the other people? And I think the more you've observed other people teach and observe students, the way they learn that, that sets you up. So that would be. Definitely. Domain advice, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and I have your book here. 
um, which, I, which is a great book. Um, and I, I thought it was absolutely amazing. Like I'd been training for a few years and I found loads of loads of lovely pieces of. Uh, I'll just tell you, anybody uh, looking, is the practical introduction to teach training in ELT published by Pavilion ELT. Oh, no. It was my sort of introductory guide if you want to get into teach training. Yeah, I thought I thought it was brilliant. Loads of lovely ideas, and I've I've stolen loads of your workshop ideas already and used them in my in in the program. Um, uh, so that's one that I that I would certainly recommend for potential teacher trainers. Have you got any other other books in mind or book recommendations for people that maybe would like to try teacher training or materials development? Uh, well, Pavilion ELT, who I have done uh, work for, we also have a series called ETpedia, um, which I think the first one came out in 2013. I wanted to write, I just wanted, trainees used to say to me, especially new trainees said, I can't afford all these books. What's one book I should buy? So we thought we'll just create this compendium of a thousand things you need to know, basically. So I wrote that and then people liked it. So we started to do a series and a couple of colleagues um, at the University of Sheffield wrote one on teacher training. So ETpedia teacher training from Pavilion ELT uh, is a good one for trainers. And they currently have a 25% discount going on until December, if anybody's interested. Um, that's my entrepreneurial business side of what I do. Um, Just so you know, we, yeah. we, we were, we were I've, I've put, because it was like, if you have two, it's 25% off. If it's three, it's 35% off. So in the school, we've, we've bought four of them so far for the December sale. So very cool. interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some, you know, good discounts for Christmas. Uh, so ETPD teacher training, other books. Um, the trouble is I still have a bookshelf of quite a lot of old books. So Macmillan used to publish sort of a resource series, methodology resource series, and some of those are out of print now, but I still kind of refer back to them. Um, my colleague, Lindsay Clanfield, just published a very nice book with Jill Hadfield called Live Online Teaching, which was an instant response to the fact we're all teaching on Zoom. So that has nice ideas. And at the moment, I'm uh, well, at the end of January, I start tutoring on an online course in being an online tutor with the university. So that's that's got nice bits in it. Mm. Um we mentioned Wallace, the reflective approach uh, published by Cambridge. I mean, yeah. that's quite an old book now, but it's, um, yep, uh, it's, it's a, it's, a, it, it still really stands up. It stood the test of time, certainly. Um, Tessa Woodwards, who does the teacher training, teach trainers magazine in sort of pilgrims in Canterbury. I mean, she's published stuff on training over the oh, years probably yeah. one of the most famous names um yeah and and then yeah it depends what you know what area of training we're talking about um okay. there's your standard kind of methodology jeremy harmer type books and then there's more specialist stuff yeah yeah um but for anybody new to teacher training i mean i wrote that short book the practical introduction it's a fairly short read but you know, with with lots of books, books that tend to sort of gain a bit of a following are generally a response to a lack of something. And there just wasn't a book as a new trainer. I just recall there wasn't a one book I could just pick up and give me a quick introduction to what I was doing. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, I, I wrote that book because of that. Um, I think I think it does that quite well. Um... And for those looking to, to perhaps move into it, I think it lays out, uh, you know, quite clear steps on how you can, or some of the steps that you can take uh, to become. I mean, I think what's interesting with, with all these methodology books now, and with all the teacher training books, the last 18 months have completely disrupted that because <laughs> they're books and they all need massively updating. They all need second and third editions because suddenly, uh, a huge part of teacher training involves the online stuff. And there's some online stuff in that book I wrote. But uh, I, I think when I wrote it, nobody had heard the word Zoom at that time. So, you we know, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you this morning. Um, I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, there's plenty of useful information here, insights, advice. And I do hope that, that, that teachers find it useful. Um, I hope you have a lovely, lovely morning writing doing whatever you're doing uh, it's a long weekend here in spain i'm not sure in in the uk okay. I think it is. 
no, no. no. <laughs> we don't um, have bank holidays. <laughs> no, no. Um, so I do hope you have a lovely weekend, and I do hope that we get to speak uh, again soon, perhaps on another Sponge Chat in the future. Yeah, thanks very much to you and Sponge ELT. I love what you're doing, Jim. Keep doing it. It's great stuff. Anyway, nice to meet you. Okay, thanks, John. Bye. Okay, bye.